Yo, what's up? Welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily for Monday, April 4th, 2022. I'm one of your host, Blessing, Addy OA Jr. Joining me is Tim Ma fucking Gettys. 4422 two, Bless. Here's the thing. A couple of weeks ago, we had Eric Voss of New Rock Stars on uh, mm. to talk about predictions for MCU stuff. And we're mm. trying to figure out dates for different movies. And we had a, a long discussion about when is Fantastic Four coming out? Because it'd be cool if it came out on 4 4 24. But then we oh. looked at it was like, oh, it's not gonna be the right day. I was absolutely wrong looking at the wrong year. I was looking at 2023. So now it is back on the table. We're putting the bets down now. Fantastic Four coming out April 4th, 2024. Let's go, baby. Can I can I say that? I was very excited. I know this is a few weeks ago now, but like when I saw Eric Voss on the show, because I think I was doing, I might have, I must have been doing PS Love You or something at the same time. It was one of those ones where in our, the way we have our Discord channel set up, right? Like we have multiple live rooms that we step into. And so like in live one, it was me, Greg, and Janet, and Barrett. And then I look at live two and I see Eric Voss's name and I was like, is that the Eric Voss? And it was the Eric Voss. I was like, hell yeah, let's fucking go. I got to go back and watch that still because like I'm ever since I joined kind of funny, my podcast listening has gone down dramatically. One, because like, you know, I would listen to podcasts while working. I can't listen to podcasts while I podcast. That's first and foremost. And then secondly, work from home. I don't have a commute. And so I don't really have the time to listen to a podcast. Usually it's, it's when I'm cooking or like when I'm going out running errands. One of the very few podcasts I listen to is new rock stars. And so I was fanboying out when I saw Eric Voss in the thing. I was like, oh, shit, here we go. All right. We got some Marvel movie talk going on. Mm -hmm. Tim, how are you doing? How was your weekend? Dude, it was one of the best weekends I've had in a long time. We had Achievement Hunter Live. We're going to tell the entire story of that on the Kind of Funny podcast later this week. Can't wait for that. And also, it was WrestleMania weekend. Do I have a voice anymore? No. Is that because of Achievement Hunter Live? Yeah, partly. Is that because I lose my goddamn mind having Stone Cold's glass break? Yeah. Oh, my God. Definitely. What a show. What a fucking show. What a weekend. Two nights, man. Oh, my God. I'm I'm sad that I I missed out on WrestleMania, right? We had Achievement Hunter Live on Saturday. And I... It's funny because I feel like this week, weekend was nonstop for shit to get hyped about between Achievement Hunter Live, WrestleMania, and then the Grammys. And so, like, at Achievement Hunter Live, I'm hanging out, right? Like, we're, we're, we're doing the live show, and then backstage, um, I forget who it was. Somebody had WrestleMania on their phone because they were watching. Yeah, it was Jeremy. Jeremy had WrestleMania on his phone. And, like, periodically, like, he'd call us out because he's, he's like, bro, Cody Rhodes <laughs> just showed up. Cody Rhodes back in the WWE, and we're all like, oh, shit, oh, let's fucking go. And, like, you know, Res- Res- WrestleMania, I feel like if you're wa- if you're keeping keeping – up with it on twitter every few minutes there's something else right and like yesterday i i didn't watch but what it seemed like keeping up on twitter is that stone cold was coming out on stage every five minutes to give somebody a stunner is that accurate uh no but like that's what it seemed like yeah no it was just it was just it was poetry man it was poetry they had a build-up night one and he had an amazing match with kevin owens and it was or so earned and so great and then night two there was a, a match going on with Pat McAfee, who is now my new favorite person. Like, apparently, he used to be a football player. Now he's just the dopest man in the, the entire planet. Um, he was going up against some some asshole. It doesn't matter. Vince McMahon was on the asshole side. And then mm. when they won, trouble was afoot. The glass hit, and Stone Cold came out and stunned the shit out of everybody. And it was poetry. I saw I saw the clip of him, Stone Cold, stunning, uh, uh, who was it? Vince McMahon. Mm-hmm. And that shit might have been some of the funniest shit I've seen. And like, it, I I, I, lo- I love that like any of the f- any of the flubs, any of the mistakes I see happen out, out of WWE usually involve Vince McMahon somehow, right? Like oh, yeah. the biggest one before this I remember watching was like him sliding into stage and like tearing both his quads all the mm-hmm. way to sliding into stage, just having to sit there mm-hmm. like a little baby and, and and try and yell at people. This one, watching it last night of him getting. The kick, right? Like Stone Cold kicks him to get him prepared for the Stone Cold stunner. He gets kicked, falls to his knees immediately because, like, I guess he just didn't anticipate it, right? Tries to stumble back up. And I've I've not seen Vince McMahon in years because I've not watched WWE in, like, over a decade. I didn't realize how old this man is. He mm-hmm. looks like he is, like, barely hanging <laughs> hanging in there. And so, like, he gets kicked, goes on his knees, trying to stumble back up, like, fucking falls back on the ropes because he's just, just – he's dizzy. He's not he's not balanced, right? Falls back. <laughs> Stone Cold <laughs> finally gets his hands on him and gives him maybe the saddest stunner I've ever seen in my life. And it was poetry. It was fantastic. It, it was – Perfect. It is probably going to be the final stunner that Stone Cold ever gives to the boss, Vince McMahon. And I loved it because it was so bad. And Stone Cold broke afterwards. And to see Stone Cold grabbing beers, cracking up to himself because he knew that, that was a disaster. Like it was just, it was such a great send off. Yeah. I, you know, I love to see it. It was fantastic. Tim, 
enough mm-hmm. about wwe let's talk about today's stories which include lego star wars the skywalker saga reviews the return of monkey island and more because this is kind of funny games daily each and every weekday at 10 a.m live right here on twitch.tv slash kind of funny games we run you through the nerdy news you need to know about if you're watching live you can correct us when we get stuff wrong by going to kind of funny.com slash you're wrong if you don't want to watch live you can watch later on youtube.com slash kind of funny games roosteeth.com or you can listen later on podcasts services around the globe by searching for kind of funny games daily remember you can use epic creator code kind of funny on all epic store and epic in-game purchases like rocket league and fortnite to help support the channel to be a part of the show to patreon.com slash kind of funny games or bronze members or above get to write in and silver members or above get the show ad free with the exclusive daily post show housekeeping for you over on tiktok uh roger has a review of lego star wars the skywalker saga we'll talk about that more on the show over on youtube there's a new episode of the kind of funny x cast uh that's mike paris and gary talking all about weird west mlb the show and what's uh, and what the new ps plus means for xbox game pass you can catch that right now on youtube.com slash kind of funny games and on podcast services around the globe we also have Morbius in review now up on YouTube.com slash kind of funny and on the in review podcast feed. Tim, is that one as, cha- as chaotic as I imagine it is? You you need to listen to it. And also, uh, everyone, if you don't know, last night, Anthony Carboni legitimately got kicked out of a theater for laughing too hard at Morbius. <laughs> That's all brand for Anthony Carboni. Continuing the Spider Boy's legacy. Hell yeah! I we watched uh, No Way Home with Anthony Carboni. I was sitting next to him, and there were, uh, during the previews, or sorry, during, during the trailers, there was the trailer for that Moon movie. I forget what it's called, but this movie about how the Moon, moon is out of drop orbit or something, right? Yeah, it was some, some bullshit like that. <laughs> and when I tell you, Anthony Carboni laughed so hard in that trailer. And because of how hard he was laughing, I couldn't hold it in and I started laughing. Anthony Carboni is a treasure. And yeah, it does not surprise me that he got kicked out <laughs> during watching Mo- Morbius. That lines up. Thank you to our Patreon producers, Fargo Brady, Pranksy, and Anonymous. Today we're brought to you by Chime, DoorDash, and Babbel. But we'll tell you about that later for now. Let's begin with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. It's time for some news. We have six stories today. A baker's dozen. Starting with our number one, Lego Star Wars has a review roundup. The embargo is up. Of course, like I said earlier, uh, we have a TikTok of Roger's review up right now. We'll pull that up in a second. Kevin, you can gear that up. Uh, Our review for Lego Star Wars Skywalker Saga, our full Mm -hmm. review is coming out uh, this week on Gamescast. But for now, let's talk about IGN and Game Informer and what they gave it. Let's start off with Metacritic, right? Right now, Metacritic is starting is sitting at an 85. On Open Critic, it is sitting at an 84. Tristan Ogilvy over at IGN gave it an 8 out of 10 and says, Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga provides some rollicking reimaginings of Star Wars' most iconic moments and sees them inside a series of interplanetary playgrounds that are dense with discovery and entertaining diversions. Certain elements like its upgrade and cover systems feel somewhat superfluous and co-op has some notable drawbacks, but there are otherwise enough laugh out Loud gags and surprising shifts in gameplay to keep me thoroughly engaged from the opening crawl of episode one all the way through to the end of episode nine, which is more than I can say for the actual movies. And then Andrew Reiner over at Game Informer gave it an eight out of ten and said, Despite being periodically uneventful, the Skywalker saga is a thorough and fun examination of all three Star Wars movie trilogies. It delivers the same sensation of being overwhelmed as opening a Blu-ray collection of films and not knowing which one you should start with. The player can bounce between trilogies and veer off a story path at any time to explore the galaxy far, far away. Some discoveries may be as dull as sand, but others may deliver something great, like Bobby Freak as a playable character, or seeing what Kylo Ren's bedroom looks like. And then Roger, I kind of funny, called it great. Uh, Kevin, you can go ahead and play the TikTok. Is it playing? Is it? Is uh, it? No, you got to give me a second. Sorry, I'm. All right, I'm no, no, no worries. I wouldn't. I saw the monitor. It was like a black screen. Hey, so I was yeah, like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Wars, the Skywalker yeah. Saga. It's pretty great. I grew up with the original games, and they're probably the reason why I love this franchise so much. The Skywalker the Saga brings that same paint. magical so energy oh, not to a brand new generation. Paint. It features massive open world planets with an incomprehensible amount of details and Easter eggs. Collecting studs is as fun as ever, and finding kyber bricks that help upgrade your character is good fun, even if those upgrades aren't that useful. Combat is completely overall. And while I did find myself button mashing more often than not, it does help to have variety. Also, 
of the writing is as clever as ever. My major issue, however, is with the mission structure. Most of it is fine, but sprinkled in are some really uninspired boss fights. Weirdly paced walk and talk sections, as well as story beats that feel completely glossed over by a little cutscene. Also, I encountered a lot of bugs, so hopefully those are fixed by the time of official release. Either way, I'm going to go into a ton of detail on this new episode of the Games Cast, but just know that Lego Star Wars, the Skywalker Saga, and there it's it pretty is. great. I grew up the patented, the patented loop. You've got to love it. Tim, yeah. how, yeah. hype are you, are, are, how hype are you for uh, the Lego Skywalker Saga? Like very, Wars, very, Skywalker. very hyped, very excited for it. Also very hyped and excited that Roger just did his first review. Very yeah. proud of our little boy growing up. Yeah, uh, but also I did not get to uh, dive as deep as I wanted to this weekend into the game because of aforementioned events that we had going on but i did get to play about an hour of it uh so far and i my review so far of this game is composed of two things one the opening cinematic is one of the most hype star wars things i have ever seen everyone needs to go check it out it is simply incredible and they they absolutely nailed it they use a lightsaber to tell the story between all the different um like episodes in the saga like yeah. throughout all the eras and everything there's awesome like vo and hype star wars music playing and it's all video transitions with like one lightsaber like a strikes going in and it's like a cut on the action like saber changes colors and then it's like the different story beats it's super damn cool you need to go check that out uh and then the other thing is within the first hour of playing there was constantly moments where i'm just going oh 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 and it's good o's everybody like i was surprised by so many things about this game like we've known that it's like different than the the previous lego games that we've had and it's them kind of like trying out like a new style of gameplay with a little bit more like the third person um you know over the shoulder type um camera angles and stuff and it is working really really well it's still a lego game at its at its core at its heart like roger was saying like the writing's there the the comedy all of it but there were moments where I'm like, this game is really pretty. And I just didn't expect really? that. So yeah, I'm, I've been very impressed. Can't wait to get back into it. And the, the level select screen, when you're going through any of the episodes, there's these like little dioramas of that represent each movie. And they're so great. There's just a lot of love and care put in this game. And I'm excited to get back to it. Hell yeah. Do you think you're going to play through all nine episodes? Yes, I do. Really? Yeah. How, how does it seem scope wise? Like to do that, do you think it's going to take you 20 to 30 hours? I, I don't know. It's hard to tell because I am extremely early. Like, I'm still at the points that are very linear. I chose episode one to start. Um, so just going through um, in that hour, I, I think I'm like maybe halfway through the level. I don't I don't know. It's hard okay. to tell, actually. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't I, I still I don't know if I'm going to jump in or not yet. Right. This is one that when it was first announced, I was like, oh, so this seems really cool. I really like Star Wars games. I'm kind of like give or take on the movies. Right. I'm like a very, very casual Star Wars fan. Right. And like. I like the idea of jumping into these games. I've never been a Lego Star Wars person. That's the other thing, too. Is like, I've never been a Lego games person. But this game seems hype just as a reason to, like, re-experience the, the movies in a different way. Uh, and, like, I'm somebody that I really like the sequel trilogy, right? Like, I really want to go back and, like, experience, uh, re-experience episode, episode 7 all the way through 9. Even though, like, you know, I have criticisms of those movies like everybody else. But there's something about the flashiness and, like, the popcorn blockbuster quality of Star Wars that, for me, is just, like... Oh, yeah, like this seems like a fun laid back time. Um, and so I want to get into it for that. It's fun to see that, like, it seems like it's getting eights across the board, right? We're talking about an eight from IGN, an eight from Game Informer, and it's sitting at mid 80 on Metacritic and Open Critic, right? Like, that seems like a solid, great um, to really great. And so, like, if that's the case, I can see myself jumping in. I don't know if I'm going to do all nine episodes. I might do one, one to three and see, like, how I feel after that. And then if I feel like jumping back in, I'll do it. I think the other thing for me right now is that when i look at april through may of video game releases it's kind of chill right like we're getting nintendo switch sports toward the end of the month and that's probably the, one of the only things uh, stanley parable also toward the end of the month and those are the two new games that i'm excited to get my hands on aside from that i think these next couple of months for me is going to be a, a a period of me jumping back and trying to catch up on all the stuff i missed during review season right i do want to catch up more i want to finish kirby first and foremost i'm on the last world and i'm sure i'm going to do a lot of post game stuff Hell there. yeah yeah I'm, and i'm having a blast with that game uh, I'm also playing. I also want to uh, go back, go back to Pokemon Legends Arceus, right? I, I might jump back, um, jump more back into Elden Ring, even though now I've like beaten the game. I've beaten Melania, who's like my big goal. I've also beaten like uh, Dragon Lord 
I don't know, I'm going to try and pronounce their last name, Placiduex or something like that, right? I beat that boss, and that was kind of like toward the end of my checklist of shit that I wanted to do in Elden Ring, but I still do know that there's tons of, like, side shit, and maybe New Game Plus that I want to do, but, like, there's that also, and I know there's a few more games where I'm like, cool, you know, uh, March was so busy with video games. What are the things that I still want to double back to in this time? So it's going to be me balancing that and maybe considering jumping back into Star Wars, the Sky Skywalker saga. Yeah, the thing I'm interested in is I want to see reviews of the Switch version in particular. Um, and I think Roger has been playing a little on PS and Switch, so I'm excited to talk to him on Gamescast and see because I was on PlayStation um, and as amazing as it looks in the HDR and all that stuff, like this is the type of game I'm like, you know what? This could be this could be great handheld and be like my bed game mm. that I just kind of play throughout the year, you know, <laughs> like making yeah. a little progress every night. So, so we'll see, but we'll see. Yeah. Tim, let's talk about story mm. number two. Return to Monkey Island has been announced. This is from Sal Romano at Gamatsu. And Kevin, I have a trailer that you can play in the background as I'm reading through this. Publisher Devolver Digital and developer Terrible Toy Box, in cooperation with Lucasfilm Games, have announced Return to Monkey Island, the long-awaited sequel to point-and-click adventure games Secret of Monkey Island and Monkey Island 2 with Chuck's Revenge. It'll launch in 2022. Platforms were not announced. Now, Tim, I was surprised yes. by two things, right, when this went up this morning. One, I was surprised by the announcement, because it's been mm -hmm. a minute since Monkey Island games have been active, right? And, like, this feels like it's coming out of nowhere. Of course, you had the, re you had the return of uh, Lucasfilm Games, right, a couple years ago and so it makes sense that now they have they they can ideally do something with it um but even with that right i feel like this is still unexpected so that was the thing that surprised me first and foremost the other thing that surprised me was how hyped people were on the timeline about this so many people i saw like people that i wasn't expecting to be excited about this announcement were excited mm -hmm. about this announcement even to the point where i went on instagram and was like seeing like folks who i know i know as non-gamers be like oh shit monkey island i love this during my childhood i'm for sure gonna jump back into this tim where are you at with monkey island is that your jam monkey island to me is an amazing amazing theme song and that is pretty much it i know it is one of the most revered point and click adventure games of all time honestly one of the most revered franchises of all time when it comes to video games but i didn't think it was right to talk on this game alone because there's one man out there that i know cares about monkey island more than anyone else on the planet and his name is the reverend jared petty holy jared. shit iris me Ah, thank you for having me. Oh my God, it's good to be here. Jared, How you it's doing? good to have you. How you Hi, doing, y'all? This is an exciting day to be alive. Okay, first off, wonderful episode so far. So much fun listening. Watch and listen practically every day. Love kind of funny games daily. It is a pollen-fueled wasteland here in eastern North Carolina right now. I'm sitting on my porch. I'm covered in yellow pine pollen, but I don't care. I'm excited because one of the greatest video games of all time is finally 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 getting a proper proper modern sequel gentlemen why do people care about this it's really very simple very 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 few video games are truly funny monkey island from start to finish monkey island one and two are hilarious they are mind bendingly funny you know all those best funny parts in psychonauts 2 monkey island is like that times 10 a lot of the time it is purely built on jokes it is a game so devoted to jokes that even the combat system is entirely about telling jokes that's how you fight people in monkey island you insult them and then they insult you back and then you come up with a better funny insult it's like this duel of dad jokes that goes on while you're fencing it is brilliant you can't die unless you try really hard to and then it's a joke that too the only way you can. <laughs> so there's there's no way to, there's no way to fail it's graphically gorgeous it has this wonderful dynamic soundtrack technology and the first two games are classically brilliantly hilarious they are still eminently playable today but this one friends this is a big deal because we didn't really ever get that this is kind of like that beautiful like superman returns retcon where we're like we're going to take monkey island 2 the peak of the series and then we're going to build a new third episode straight from that one that kind of ignores the rest of the continuity after that now i love the monkey island games but the two first ones are the best ones what what, what so was after kind of like, what's the the lineage of that jared after the first oh two? god there's there's secret there's return there's uh oh, I, now i can't remember my brain is dead right now uh, Secret and Return are, are the two like like cornerstone ones. I mean, you find good jokes in all of them. One of my favorite jokes is from one of the later games, which is just 
that's the second biggest giant monkey head I've ever seen. Uh, you know, there's these beautiful, beautiful <laughs> moments. But, okay, I'm talking too much. I did not, this is like, I understand this is not like Metroid Dread levels of hype, but in my little head canon, the idea that Ron fucking Gilbert is going to come out in 2022 and be like, by the way, we've been working in the secret Monkey Island game for two years, and it's everything I ever wanted, and I only made it because it's exactly the way I wanted it to be from beginning to end. That is like this auteur moment. That's like, it would be like if Kojima came out and said, by the way, I'm making an MSX only sequel to Metal Gear 2. It's Metal Gear 3, and it's everything I dreamed of in 1989. Like, and then he got to make it. That's what this is. Okay, I've talked too much for you talented people. I'll shut up for a minute. You talk. I, I have a question for you, Barrett. Or, sorry, Jared. Looking at the uh, um, the trailer here, what's the trailer itself make you feel? Evocative mystery. Uh, I like that they don't get very much. Uh, that's my my favorite thing about it here. This is just a this is just a tantalizing little teaser bit. This is a nugget. This is code. This is code for, yo, ye who love the Monkey Island, behold, that which you dreamed could never happen is about to take place. This is like receiving a cipher message. It is the fucking book of revelation, <laughs> full of little mysteries designed to tantalize you and tease your brain. But unlike the book of revelation, it will not be misinterpreted into some kind of horrific apocalyptic <laughs> MAGA dead end world ending apocalypse. It will instead result in a video game the likes of which we have rarely seen in all of history. Friends, games are never funny and brilliant. I was, I, I had this rare I mean, opportunity. Yeah, go that ahead, excites go ahead. me. Like, I mean, everything you're talking about, Jared, excites me. I'm somebody who missed out on on Monkey Island, but like, I think plenty of us have played the fruits of those games, right? Like, plenty of us have played double double fine games. Like, one of my favorite point and click adventure games from the last decade has been broken age and i know that comes from tim schaefer who back in the day worked on uh monkey island right and plenty of us played telltale games which i know are also results of the fruits of monkey island right like monkey island is very influential for what it was as a point and click adventure game and what it did uh as far as like humor in video games and like you talking about it reminds me of, of if like a of a toby fox made undertale and then disappeared and then disappeared for a decade or two and then came back with a sequel to that it seems like this is one of those situations where this thing that did something very specific and something that really uh, that really hit home for a lot of people is gone and we don't have things that are like it and now we're getting the direct sequel to that thing that strikes me as very exciting the thing i want to ask right because we we're talking about the the trailer and kevin if you're able to bring the trailer back up it seems like this is uh, there's a there's a phrase that I love from Snowbike Mike, right? And we have the the emoji for it or the emote for it, right? He talks about setting the tone, and it seems like one that is very much setting the tone of what you look forward to from the sequel, right? Like the art style in this in this trailer looks incredible, looks really polished, almost reminds me a little bit of a um, uh, Hades developer. I, I forget their name escapes me for, uh, for a second, but like Super Hades Pyre, Super Giant. Thank you so much. Yeah, it looks almost Super Giant ish in terms of like polish and art style and how 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 good these models look. Uh, Jared, like for you, what, what are you looking forward to out of the sequel? Like, what do you want to see? Okay. So I, you were talking about Tim Schafer a second ago, blessing. Uh, I, mm. I got an opportunity to talk to him recently for, for limited run. And I'm going to paraphrase him here, but he worked on Monkey Island as well. Um, uh, and then went on to make Rope and Age and things like that. But Tim, I asked him why it's hard to make funny video games. And Tim laughed and said, I don't think it's hard to make funny video games at all. He said, I don't understand why more video games aren't funny. He said, they, in paraphrasing here, he's like, video games are, are about you putting like this little avatar in a weird space and like throwing pies in people's faces, but also you're supposed to have a serious story. Like we're supposed to be emotionally involved in this ridiculous world of side quests and giant monsters and strangers. Monkey Island gets that. This trailer indicates that. This is all about creating an experience where your brain will be teased and when your brain is teased, you're going to laugh and laugh and laugh. I mean, fundamentally, um, oh, Dan, that worked on uh, uh, Layer of the Clockwork Gods said something similar in an interview once. He's like, you know, most good adventure game puzzles boil down to there's a key. And finding the key does two things. One, it makes you feel clever. And two, it makes you laugh out loud. Because the key is the joke. Mm. 
Very few video games are built around that anymore. It's a lost art practically. Again, Psychonauts 2 being a real exception. And we're going to be privileged, guys, because this isn't... I mean, I love Kratos and Boy wandering through the wasteland together, having heavy conversation. And I, I love of Ellie and Joel. And, and But I don't get to laugh enough over and over and over again when I experience this beautiful media. And that's what this is all about. Yeah. Joy I mean, and stupidity combined in the best possible way. I would, I would, would thousand percent feel that, right? Like for me, when I think of the funny games of... Again, like the last decade that I think of that really struck a core, that really struck a core with me, right? I think of Portal, I think of Borderlands, I, again, I think of Undertale, right? But like all these games I name are games that I think do strike a chord with people and do really become memorable because, like you're saying, many games don't really double down on, hey, let's just be funny, like let's make that the, the drive of this, right? I also think of games like Jazz Punk, which have like cult followings that might not break through uh, to everybody because not not necessarily everybody is looking for this specific type of humor. But when you have that kind of humor, those games become very special to you. I mean, honestly, like just uh, not to go on too much of a tangent here, but uh, even with Lego Star Wars, right? Like going through these games, it is just the movies, but you're playing through them. But there's something that's special where if it was just a, a, a normal Star Wars game where you're playing through all the, the episodes, it wouldn't be as special but because the lego games focus on the humor and the 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 jokes i feel like it kind of is what gives it that personality that makes it a worthwhile video game that's Jared. not a tangent at all that's brilliant tim i am so on board with that like i love the lego games for the same reason they take this familiar thing and then they they just slightly absurdify it and embrace the gaminess of it all and and that's what these monkey island games do i know i'm evangelizing hope i'm not repeating myself too much in summation, that to keep it succinct, friends, you play these games to feel clever and laugh, to beat your head against the wall a little bit of the puzzle, then you go talk to a friend or look up the solution and go, oh, of course. And the solution's so funny that even if you have to look it up, you laugh when you do it. But also the act of failing is hilarious, the way they write them. It rewards failure with humor. Or it rewards success with humor. I have mm. a thousand percent confidence in this. I very rarely want to hype up a game too much before it comes out but it's not like this track record hasn't been proven monkey island one and two are probably the best classic adventure games of them all along with grim fandango they are just about perfect and now we're getting another part another installment a sequel in that lineage and that is so precious what a gift do you do you think there's any so pressure? Man, do you think there's any pressure on this game coming out in uh, right now? It's, it's slated for 2022. You know, this being a classic adventure game and it not being around for a while. I know when we talk about adventure games, we talk a lot about the uh, all right, like what is the solution? All right, I'm like now I'm clicking everything because I collected a weird like crowbar and now I'm clicking the crowbar against every single door and every single surface because I can't figure out how to solve this thing and as we've as we've gone on we've gotten more and more iteration whether we're talking about Telltale whether we're even talking about like Quantic Dream games or um, or uh, uh, Don't Nod stuff right like there have been a lot of iteration on narrative games a lot of iteration on point and click adventure games a lot of iteration on cinematic adventure games that have pushed things forward and it made things I guess easier in terms of all right, I want to progress in the story. I don't want to hit my head against the wall over and over again. Do you think there's any pressure on Monkey Island, this new one, to adapt with the times and figure out like how to feel more modern? Or do you think it's sticking with what made classic Monkey Island, classic Monkey Island is going to work for it? I think that I think they're going to be deliberately anachronistic based on what I'm seeing here. Um, and when I say, but understand that Monkey Island, while being an anachronistic adventure game, is easily the most accessible of the anachronistic adventure games. It was a revolution when it came out. It really did change the way that we interacted with these games. It was the beginning of the movement toward modern conveniences and adventure games. So it's much more accessible than, say, like old Sierra's old game. You can't get stuck in a monkey island. Not really. Like, you can't put yourself in a corner where you can't win. You can't do any of that stupid adventure <clears throat> game stuff. And again, they have these really creative ways to reward failure that sometimes make the experimentation a lot of fun. But I think they're going to lean into, I'm going to guess this, this is probably going to be a non-hint system game because they're going to lean into the fact that simply the people buying this, adventure games don't sell that well anyway. This one will sell better because of the kudos, but it's still not going to be like a massive seller. And they know the people who buy this game have the internet. So they're not going to worry, 
the people playing have a built-in but you know there here's your accessibility toggle for difficulty in this game it's the internet like if you don't know what to do google how do i how do i get past the giant rubber chicken and you know you will know in two seconds you're like oh and you move on to the next and so that allows them to, to just kind of push you forward that's what i'm expecting from this one i am not a huge fan of irritating anachronisms in games but this isn't a barrier to enjoyment um Jared, i don't need that here Jared, uh, to, before we let you go there's one last question i have for you here is there a right version of monkey island one and two to play <laughs> Well, I'm going to recommend the ones that uh, that limited run games. Published. You motherfucker, no, 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 no. <laughs> this isn't a shill situation. I'm trying to be real, <laughs> unless that well, is the yeah, honest I mean, answer. Obviously, obviously, the way to do it is to get our Sega CD <laughs> physical disc replay and play it on that. Because the real reason that. he, that's he right. came through. That that's the way to do it. Uh huh. Um, uh -huh. Everybody's got their okay. Everybody's got their um, their grumpies about the various re-releases that, that have been done for this. Um, I think you're fine, honestly. With a lot of it's splitting hairs for anybody that's never played it before. I think you're fine with any version of this that allows you to play the game with the original graphics and dynamic sound. And there are plenty of ways to do that to this day. Okay. Um, as long as you and the, the remade graphics are actually very pretty. But I, I think you go with original graphics and dynamic sound. You don't even need the voice stuff. Like I, I, I like to play it sometimes without the talky parts and just the text on at the bottom of the screen. But that's that's just me. Um, how about this? I don't think there's a bad way to play Monkey Island. Well, there you uh, go. Maybe they, this is a stream yeah, game yeah, blast. Look. Maybe we. we I mean, play I can be through, down. You know. Yeah. yeah, no, this sounds like a fantastic time. And I, this is it's one that I've always wanted to return to, especially after playing Broken Age and, and loving it so much. And so, Jared Petty, thank you so much for, one, selling us on Monkey Island and then also enlightening us with how exciting this new one is. Appreciate you. Well, thank you all for having me as I texted all of you madly this morning going, oh, my God, let me come rant about Monkey Island. Friends, you do the best in the business. I miss you and I love you. God, it was amazing seeing you, Blessing, during GDC. Tim, I'm sorry I didn't see you. Um, and it, it kind of hurts my heart that, that I was not there and able to Kevin also missed you friends, best friends are kind of funny. Love you and miss you. Y'all are still the best job I've ever had and I'll never forget you. Love y'all. Love so you, Jared. Love you too, Talk Jared. to you soon. Tim, we're going to hop into mm -hmm. our next news story, but before we do, I want to let people know out there, know about patreoncom slash kind of funny games so they can go and get the show ad free. And speaking of ads, let us tell you about our sponsors. No one likes waiting on a paycheck, especially when you've got bills due. Good thing there's Chime. Now you can get your paycheck up to two days early with direct deposit. That's up to two more days to save, pay bills, and generally just feel good about your money situation. But Chime is more than just getting paid early. It's also an award-winning mobile app, checking account, debit card, and optional savings account. So what are you waiting for? Hopefully not your paycheck. Get started with Chime today. Applying for a free account takes less than two minutes. Get started at Chime.com slash KF Games. That's Chime.com slash KF Games. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank and Stride Bank NA members FDIC. Early access to direct deposit funds depend on the payer. You got back-to-back -back meetings, errands to run, and chores to take care of. What's the secret to clearing your to-do list? A little help from DoorDash. You can get dinner, household essentials, and everything on your grocery list delivered. I'm gonna pause the ad and tell you, ladies and gentlemen, how do I know so much about DoorDash? I used it this morning. I, was, I woke up, I had to get the house ready. I, I had this guy coming to work on the garage. I had the nanny coming over. We had no clean bottles. I cleaned the bottles and everything. And I was like, I'm hungry and I need coffee and I don't have time to make either. I door dashed uh, Jen and I some breakfast today and it was great. When I was sick last week, I door dashed Gatorade because I wasn't about to go out. Door dash is great. Back to what they wrote. Ordering is easy and your items will be left safely outside your door when you choose contactless delivery drop off. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code KINDAFUNNY. That's 25% off up to a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code KINDAFUNNY. Don't forget, that's code KINDAFUNNY for 25% off your first order with DoorDash, subject to change, terms apply. 
For most of us, learning a second language in high school or college wasn't exactly a high point in our academic careers. I took three years of French and guess what? It didn't stick. Now, thanks to Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, there's an addictively easy and fun way to learn a new language. Whether you'll be traveling abroad, connecting in a deeper way with family, or just have some free time, Babbel teaches you bite-sized language lessons that you'll actually want to use in the real world. Uh, je parle un peu français, and I was talking to Jen's mom here and there about little things. Mon chapeau, you know what it's about. Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel lessons were created by over 100 language experts. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and accent. I could use that for English. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, you can save up to 60% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash kindoffunny. That's babbel.com slash kindoffunny for up to 60% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Story number three, Tim, let me tell you about the PlayStation Plus hack that PlayStation doesn't want you to know, or do they? This is from Robert Ooh. Anderson at IGN. PlayStation users are currently taking advantage of a new exploit that will net them over six years worth of PlayStation Plus premium at what is effectively half price. First spotted by at Wario64 on Twitter and verified by our deals team at IGN Deals, you can currently purchase a 12-month PlayStation Now subscription for $60. It'll be converted to a PS Plus premium membership, which is set to cost $120 annually once the new service launches in June. Sony had previously blocked the option to buy more than one month of PS Now, but this workaround link is still live for now. And place is still live for now. And PlayStation users have been quick to stack up as many years of PlayStation Now as they can, ready for the one-to-one -one conversion in June. As far as we know, you won't be punished for using this exploit, but it's clear Sony probably doesn't want you doing it either. It's likely going to get shut down soon, so if you're going to take advantage, you better do it soon. That's one heads up for, hey, if you're trying to get a deal on PlayStation Plus Premium by the time it comes through in June, boom, buy a bunch of PlayStation now. But also, I don't think this is one that PlayStation is worried about because this means that you're buying a bunch of PlayStation now, which I'm sure they're very happy with. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's you're you're right on the money there i also am a little trepidatious about this where i feel like we don't have enough information to know that this is going to work perfectly so like personally i wouldn't do this with my money but mm -hmm. hey if this is something you're into live your life boo boo yeah there you go and tim speaking to playstation story number four could we get playstation 3 emulation after all this is armina khan at playstation lifestyle the days of Sony overlooking the PS3 may be over. It's being reported that the company is looking into properly bringing the PS3 emulation to PS5 less than a week after being criticized for announcing that PS Plus premium subscribers will only be able to cloud stream PS3 games. According to VentureBeat journalist and insider Jeff Grubb via Video Games Chronicle, Sony might be up to something here. While it, while, it, while it has long been argued that PS3's architecture is to blame for complicating things, fans and some game developers remain unconvinced that this is the case. Quote, emulation of PS3 is absolutely possible on the PS5 hardware, wrote Night Dive Studios' Dimitri Giannakis, aka Modern Vintage Gamer. Uh, they continued, quote, Sony has never been interested in investing the millions, of, the millions to make it happen, however. Known modder Lance McDonald added that he, quote, can't get over Sony announcing that they have a PS1 and PS2 emulator up and running on PS4 and PS5 hardware, but they're locking both behind a subscription fee and won't let you play discs you already own. Also, they still can't get PS3 emulation on the PS5, end quote. Grub claims he asked around the company's plans, uh, and from what he's heard, Sony might be working on bringing PS3 emulation to PS5, but it'll take some time. There you heard it from Grub's mouth himself. Tim, do you have faith that we're going to get there with PS3 emulation? I do at some point. I don't think that it's uh, going to be in June. You know, I, I feel like with uh, the way that Spartacus has kind of actually played out and uh, with, with the way that Sony's been handling it right now, I, I think that uh, expectations should be kind of set a little more correctly now uh, where we know that it's coming in June. We know exactly what it is and we know that it's not something really worth being that excited for. Um, I'm most excited to see the list of games kind of just to see if there is any surprises, but I'm not really expecting many. I think that it's going to be very similar to the PS now list we've seen before games that we've seen on services before. We're not going to be getting the ones that we didn't, right? We're not going to be getting the licensed uh, soundtrack games. So I think that that is the, the biggest bummer yeah. from the earlier generation, like PS2 specifically, is what I'm thinking about, um, and even PS1 to an extent. But uh, with the PS3 stuff, like I, it's 
what complicates this is the millions of dollars side of it. I think that there is a a small subsect of people in the grand scheme of things that are actually asking for PS3 backwards compatibility, but that small section is very loud. Like this to me is a perfect example of vocal minority, right? And mm -hmm. at some point, vocal minorities, when they're loud enough, they win out. And so I can see Sony's being like, you know what? Fuck it. We got to invest this just to like quell this because we don't need to add more issues to uh, the litany of things coming at Sony at all times, right? Um, but I imagine that that isn't going to be in the beginning when they are first getting everyone acclimated to this new PlayStation Plus. Uh, but I imagine that when they are trying to like beef it up and add a little bit more to it, that's when that'll come. I think it's weird that they have the three tiers already um, that they're talking about. Like that sounds complicated and like not overly complicated but just more complicated than i would assume sony would want to be in 2020 it sounds like more complicated than it needs to be like i'd love to be in the room for the discussions of why do three tiers instead of two and i wonder if it is them being like hey it's the hardest of the hardcore that want the legacy stuff and so let's give them that extra price to pay if they really want that legacy stuff whereas like ps plus extra which is the the second tier that gets you all the ps4 and ps5 games library i think that's the one that they're probably really going to try and hit home for people that are the general playstation audience that want access to a bunch of games and want that buy-in to go Oh man, all right, without PlayStation Plus Extra, I have my 30 games that I own, but with PS Plus Extra, I'm going to get hundreds that I might have missed out on and now I just have this this library, right? Similar to Xbox Game Pass. I think that's probably the the, the thought process behind it, but I don't know, man. If I I I feel like it 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 almost be easier just to lump in the legacy stuff with the PlayStation Plus Extra, but maybe they just want that extra cash. Well, yeah, so so here's the thing um with that. It's like I I feel like they the, the problem with it is that from our side of things, bless, like me and you having talked about this for so long, it was always like, oh, it's complicated because they're pushing too many brands and they're not able to push them equally because there's PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now. And when you have different services, especially when your competitors have more so than anything kind of like consolidated them like it, there still is xbox gold and xbox game pass but like there is ultimate that allows you just kind of get everything and like that's the thing that they push the most like that is the get game pass ultimate right like that's their their marketing now playstation at least has oh we have playstation plus and then you have to kind of get in and figure out the tiers it's unfortunate that there's still levels that it's still convoluted to that extent but uh there's a marketing theory that i'm blanking on the name right now i was watching a video with uh mkbhd recently uh where he was talking about this where the theory is um if you there's a strategy to the amount of products that you're you're putting out there and this is something that apple has applied a lot over time and uh studies found that if you add three things more people are likely to get the two even if the prices of, if, of the two things were less than what the full thing would have been when there's three that doesn't really make sense when i said it but i i think you guys understand what i'm trying to say here um that the strategy is they're adding the three because they want most people to do the second one and they'll look at the highest one and be like oh that's too expensive i don't need that i'll get the second oh, one even though easy. really they might have just got the first one to begin with add on top of that the fact that you look at this sony's entirely doing it because putting the ps1 and ps2 classics on the highest level they know that they're speaking to the niche audience that's like we're gonna we'll pay more for that premium shit because that's the the stuff we want but they know that that's not the most enticing thing to the majority of people yeah. which is the playstation 5 games which is why the second tier is at the end of the day gonna be the one that sony pushes the most and the most popular um option for sure. And it's, I mean, it's the same way that with, with Nintendo Switch Online, they did the expansion pack that was here's N64 games, here's uh, Sega games, and then also here's Animal Crossing DLC. And I think most of us went, oh, this seems like a weird deal. We're, I'm not going to buy into that. And me, I'm like, ah, oh, but I, I love those N64 games. I guess I'm going to buy into it. And I, 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 I think you're exactly on the money that the second tier is probably the one that they are uh, viewing as the most, even though, it's, even though it's not PS Plus essential, they're viewing it as the essential tier and they're going to push it that way. And I think most people are going to buy into that. I do I do still want to see like what that library looks like because if it is like a Nintendo Switch Online, right? Like that expansion pack, I think even over the last six months has gotten way more enticing as they've added in. Here's Mario Kart 8 uh, uh, Deluxe DLC, right? Here's even more SC4 games. Here's more other games, right? Like the more you build that library, the more enticing it gets. And I imagine that that might be a similar strategy they use for this, where PS Plus Extra, which is the second tier that you get PS4 and PS5 games with, that is going to be what PlayStation Now is, where they are cycling in games and then cycling out games. And if you have games that are coming out, out there day and date, and you have games that like are exciting, right? Like you, uh, let's say by 
fall if they have or let's say like by 2023 if they add in the horizon forbidden west in in there right and the, the new exciting games the new ish exciting games in there i think that'll be enough to get make people go oh shit all right yeah i'm very happy with my ps plus extra purchase whereas for essential if it is this hey we're starting off with I'm not sure, i think they've already given a number but i'm just gonna say if we we'll start off with 30 ps1 games 30 ps2 games and by the end of 2023, it is now 60 PS1 games, 60 PS2 games. I think over time, you just have more people transition over and go, oh, shit, they have Burnout 3. I fucking love Burnout 3 when I played it as a kid. I'm definitely going to up my tier for this month so I can play more of this. And then they forget that they update, and now they're, they're still paying for it. I think they're I, – I think even though it's complicated, I can see the vision. And I, I'm just curious on how it plays out because I think there's – I think the, from an audience pers perspective, right, and from a podcast perspective, there's beauty in, in simplicity. And I, like, deep down, I go, "Oh man, it'd be nice if it was just two tiers." I get what they're doing business wise. Like, I, I, I think there's something there, but it's all gonna speak when the games are actually announced and we know what it is um, by the time June comes around. So, keeping an eye on it, I'm kind of excited for it. Like, even though, even though the the actual details for me was a bit of a bummer when it was announced, I'm still excited for this thing. Like, I want to know what that library looks like, and I'm glad that they're giving people like. Returnal on there and Miles Morales on there and other games. And so we'll wait and see. Story number five, Tim. There's a new Elden Ring patch. This is from Joel Scrabbles, a made-up name over there at IGN. Bandai Namco has announced a small Elden Ring patch, which will be released today, April 4th, across all platforms. The patch buffs some attacks for boss uh, Star Scourge Radon, who was an unintentionally made weaker in the latest version of the game. Elden Ring's 1.03 patch arrived last month and made a lot of adjustments to the game. However, one was unintentional, making the famously tricky Radon far weaker than he was meant to be when using some attacks. A new version of 1.03 arrives today as a result. The only the only patch note reads, quote, fixed a bug in the balance adjustment of the boss Star Scourge Radon in update 1.03, in which the power of some attacks was unintentionally reduced, end quote. The patch comes to PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, and Steam today. Uh, this is kind of a funny one because, yeah, in one of the previous patches, they they nerfed the hell out of Radon. And a lot of people were like, what, what the fuck are you doing? Like, why would you nerf this boss? Like, this boss is supposed to be supposed to be hard. Like, Tim, for context of who mm -hmm. Radon is, because I'm sure yeah, I'm sure you have all the questions about Radon. Star Series Radon, as they call him, right? Radon is like this badass, like, military leader, right? Like, and at his boss, this slight spoilers for Elden Ring, cover your ears if you want to know nothing about Radon, if you somehow missed who Radon is, right? Uh, basically, you get to his boss fight. You get to like his, his like, not even his boss fight, his boss area, right? Like his dungeon, let's call it. You get there, and it's basically like this festival that's being thrown. And you talk to the NPCs, and they're all like, "Oh yeah, we're here for the Radon Festival." Basically, what it is is, yeah, this boss that is like one of the the shard bearers who are like the big bosses in the game game to him. He's like, yeah, he throws on this festival, let's say every year, uh, where he like beats everybody at everybody's asses. <laughs> and because he's like this powerful dude and he's like if i die i want to die with honor so every year i'm gonna throw this festival and so the gimmick of the boss fight is you get to the actual boss arena which is like this fucking like vast ass land like this vast empty land you get there and you have like all of these like like summoning uh spots where you go around you summon all these npcs and you fight along a bunch of npcs and it's like this big ass war on Radon. It's like one of the Sick. fucking dopest boss fights. I think I think there is in a from software game. I absolutely loved love it. And he's kind of supposed to be overly hard because you're supposed to summon like hell during that boss. Uh and like when I played it, I played it before they nerfed him and I thought it was like a fine difficulty. I didn't think it was like super hard, especially after summoning all those, all those NPCs. Um but yeah, that, that led to a lot of people going all right, well, why are you nerfing him? It seems like the balancing was fine. It didn't seem like he was that hard that you needed to, to, to nerf him. And it seemed like that was a mistake. So that makes sense. That lines up. Um, Tim, mm -hmm. play some Elden Ring. It'll change your life. Yeah, yeah. What what will it take for you to get into Elden Ring? I, I just don't know that it, I, did, I don't know that I can. It's just not for me. So much of it mm -hmm. sounds great. So much of it is epic and cool. But I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's like Lord of the Rings. I have now seen the Lord of the Rings movies at least five times each. And I get it and i appreciate it i don't like it i just don't and that's okay i understand it i respect it i understand its quality same thing with elden ring didn't yeah. beat it but it's a lord of the ring situation i can tell yeah i feel that let's round out the story number six a 2001 demo for gex jr has leaked online this is zach's wisen at kotaku and kevin i have a video if you can pull it up as i read through gex is back but not I'm how not father, how his fans Luke. probably were In hoping junior for form. 
in junior form. Uh, very relatable, actually. Uh, instead of a new game or remake, fans can check out a demo for Gex Jr., a never-before-seen PS1 spinoff of the original Gex franchise. This new demo has surfaced online over 20 years after it was seemingly abandoned. The new unfinished demo for Gex Jr. comes courtesy of Just Zoot uh, and has been uploaded to the fantastic Hidden Palace website. The demo appeared with no real warning, just showing up yesterday, surprising many and confusing most. The demo seems to be set in a movie theater-like level and, and has Gex Jr. collecting cans of soda. The simple level design and objectives coupled with the game's name and overall look seem to imply this game was going to be aimed at kids or younger players. Uh, that's the end of the article. And the thing that I want to point out is that this is definitive proof that Gex fucks Tim. All right? I said it last time when we were talking about Gex, and I'll say it again. We have the proof here. Gex Jr., he lives and breathes. That is... A very interesting point, bless <laughs> that I I had not considered. God, God. Um, and that is a I, for some statement. Yeah, you know, I I thought it was just this was Gex when he was little, but you're right, that wouldn't make sense. Uh, and we do Junior. see, we do well, see the he, the, the he main could be Gex he could have always been Gex Junior. Oh yeah, there you go. But that that could be the father of Gex, mm -hmm. the the you know the grand. Oh God, where are I, you? I like the idea. Well. I like the idea that Gex Jr. could actually just be because yeah, when I heard Gex Jr., I was like, well, certainly that's Gex's child, but mm -hmm. maybe it is a baby Mario situation. Exactly. But does that Which, make sense calling him Gex, Gex, Gex Jr.? Wait, wait, wait. None wait, of it makes sense. Nothing about this makes Mario, sense. Mario just Mario as a baby. Yeah. That's what I assumed. Yeah. Huh. Mm-hmm. You that's think? Wait, case. you think Mario had a baby and called him Mario? I mean, he, if if Mario were to have a baby, just so that we're clear, if he were to have twins he would absolutely call him name him mario and luigi 100 percent. i don't no. oh my god i can't believe we're about to do this get into the fucking deep lore of super mario in yoshi's island which mm. is the the origin of baby mario there's no princess in it it's luigi that gets captured and you're trying to save luigi so Yoshi takes baby Mario to go save Luigi. You eventually do that. And then in the final cut scene, you see legs of Mario and Luigi, baby Mario and baby Luigi's parents. They do not look like the legs of the Mario that we know and love. How do they, they don't? What is, that? What, what is the difference between their legs and Mario's legs? <laughs> Why are you doing this to me, Bless? You could just curious. let it go. I didn't know you, I didn't know you had as like the it, details on this. As I was saying, I was like, I don't fucking know. They're legs. You know what I mean? Are they're, they like skinnier? Because I know Mario has like them short stubby legs, but like, you know, you know describe the legs. And I'm going to. Uh, I never definitely... got to the end of uh, really? Mario World 2. No. Oh, you messed up. I never got you to see those up. legs. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to bring up the video so that. Kev can bring this up because this is the most important mm, thing right now. Mm, I will also mm. say that the Mario franchise, I think, does follow some kind of like rule set when it comes to naming, where there is Bowser Jr. and Bowser Jr. is Bowser's child. That's not baby Bowser. I but would then think there's baby also Bowser the Koopa is... kids, though, which is the problem. Well, the Koopa, <laughs> that... Aren't the, aren't the Koopa, Koopa kids like siblings with Bowser Jr.? But that, I mean, that's weird, right? <laughs> Is I think it? that's like an ultimate. Well, I mean, here's the thing: are they wait, all wait, twins? What? Why? Yeah. Why is that weird? Because maybe well, Bowser Jr. is the older one. Yeah. Like, was the first pop like, out, and where? then they had eightlets. I'm sure that's not the name of it. Like this isn't a George Foreman situation. You know what I mean? What's the chat saying? The Cooper kids have been retconned to not be Bowser's kids. That's the problem. There's retconning going on here because Bowser Jr. was convinced that Peach was his mom, and that gets really dark when you think about it. So, Kev, can you bring oh, up what I what I just said? Octopus, yeah, yeah. thank you. And uh, Plus, it, you yeah, know the thing just, about uh, George's kids, George Foreman. Just go to he's 308, got, he's got, please. He's got five sons, all named George Foreman. Oh, I didn't know they were all. I know I knew like at least a couple of them were named George Foreman. No, Foreman. all five. Foreman. I didn't know all of them were. Yeah, right. He was great. So this is the end. Spoilers of uh, Yoshi's Island, um, and the the store Komi brings you little baby Mario back to your home. You oh, sh he's not from New York. <laughs> I don't think he's ever. <laughs> he's from the Mushroom oh. Kingdom, is he? I mean, you know, he's supposed like Brooklyn. Like, there's a lot of retconning going on, man. Like people over there not getting their shit straight. But look, we're about to see this door open, and then who's there? You see them legs. Who's there? <laughs> Let me see them legs. <laughs> Let me see them legs. Oh, interesting. Oh, you're right. Yeah, no, that. Well, 
I don't know. I just don't get Mario vibes, man. That might be the art style, though. I don't know. Here's the thing. I'm with you. Baby Mario and Baby Luigi are definitely just Mario and Luigi yeah. as babies. Yeah. But it doesn't make any like sense. I don't like these hands. It doesn't make any sense. Like, if Miyamoto point... came out, though, and like said, hey, no, these are their children, I wouldn't. I don't think I could doubt it. Like I don't think there's enough there, there yeah, to I, it. I can see all, those being Mario's legs. All I'm, I'm like... At what point do they start doing the plumbing in the original Mario games, Mario Bros? Like, where does that fall in? I don't, yeah, man. <laughs> what do you define as plumbing? What do you define as doing to come the up with, We you need know, to come up with the, 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 the Mario timeline, story. everyone. Because, like, in Mario, in Super Mario Brothers, they have the pipes. And if, I mean, I feel like that's plumbing enough, right? Like, that's Yeah, the but I'm saying in, in Mario Bros, that looks like a very industrial city that we st we have yet to see. That's why the assumption is... It's no, New, New Dong City. Oh, interesting. In Mario Odyssey, they do that whole Donkey Kong thing, yeah, right? Like, yeah, yeah, you're making a lot of sense. But then there's also the Mario RPGs, right? There's the Mario and Luigi partners in time and all that stuff. And like they fucking, I, I don't know, man. This shit goes deep. We're going to have to have someone figure it out. And it's not going to be me. I'm just a leg enthusiast. Anyway, I'm very glad that they dug up this Gex Jr. <laughs> demo. Yeah. Uh, especially uh, coming off of our conversation about Gex a few, a few weeks ago. I forget what brought up that conversation. I think we might have been talking about Gex possibly coming back. Or maybe Gex it was an accusation. Jr. Yeah. Well, wait, was that the conversation a few weeks ago? Because we talked oh, about this. No, no, no. Yeah, we were just talking about the Gex fucks. Yeah, we we're talking. I guess we we're just talking about how Gex be fucking. Um, and now we have the proof. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, actually, Kevin, can you bring up the trailer one more time? Actually play it with, um, with uh, sound. Have you heard the sound before? I have heard like the sound. It. Okay. I know. He makes some references that I want to hear Tim hear. Oh, no. Because Gex, of course, like, Gex makes a lot of pop culture references. Yeah, this is Gex Jr. The I'm your demo. father, Luke. Jesus. <laughs> I think he says one more thing. Oh, that might be it. Can you yeah. say... Tail time. Oh, 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 oh. All right, that's enough. No, no. <laughs> the, the gluck plug. The gluck plug is is the thing that killed oh, me. Oh my fucking god! I missed that era, man. I don't okay, know, bring man. Bring back X. Bring it back. Like we, you know how we had that era of indie games that are like a lot of Super Nintendo style. Oh, here's a bunch of ro uh, um, Metroidvanias and roguelites and like a bunch mm -hmm. of cool 2D pixel art stuff. Like I love that we got that that era of indie games. I feel like we've not gotten like the true like N64 like Ukulele. all in tributes. Like we've gotten some of them. Ukulele is one and I know we've gotten a couple others. But like I want I want like a three year period where we're just drowning in janky ass 3D platformers. Cause I miss it. Yeah. I want to cosplay as Gex. I'm saying it right now on the show. Oh, Tim, I can't wait for you to cosplay as Gex. But that day is probably just so far away. If I want to know what's coming out to Mom and Drop Shops today, where would I look? The official list of upcoming software across each and every platform is listed by the kind of funny games daily show hosts each and every weekday. Yeah. Get, get, away from, get the jingle out of here. I don't do the jingle. We don't need that shit. Yeah. I'll fuck with that. Forgot my bad. Out today, we got dashing dodgems for Switch. Uh, that's the only out today. Uh, new days for you. Nobody Saves the World is coming to PS5, PS4, and Switch on April 14th. And then a new Lost in Random costume comes to Sad Boy A Big Adventure this Friday. Okay. Uh, there you go. A collaboration that nobody was expecting. Uh, deal <laughs> of the day for you. PlayStation Now games have been revealed for April. You're getting Outer Wilds, WRC 10, FIA World Rally Championship, uh, Journey to the Savage Planet, and then Werewolf the Apocalypse Earthblood. Uh, now it's time, Tim, for kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong, where you write in and let us know what we got wrong as we got it wrong, so we can correct it for those watching later on youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames and on podcast services around the globe. Vander SN does uh, uh, write in to say that Miyamoto has gone on record saying that Bowser Jr.'s mom is canonically Miyamoto. And <laughs> <laughs> apparently, Mama people Luigi. who say article about it. Do you remember Mama Luigi, bless? Vaguely. Was this a cartoon thing? Yeah. Yeah, I vaguely <laughs> the remember. The Mario this. cartoon. Yeah. Luigi was a Yoshi's mom for some reason. <laughs> they kept calling him Mama Luigi. <laughs> one, of my, one of my earliest memories is of being in kindergarten and they wheeled in one of those like CRT uh, TVs with like the VHS uh, player like built in there and us watching a Mario cartoon. Dude, I one of my first memories of that Mario cartoon was it would play at 6 a.m. in the morning. 
mm. before school. Mm. And obviously, fuck that. That sucks when you're a little kid. Um, but randomly one day I was awake that early and I saw it and I was like, I'm going to wake up every day of my life at 6 a.m. because I need to see this cartoon. And there was a stretch where I did just to Hell watch yeah. it. And I recorded with my talk boy <laughs> like <laughs> through the speaker, the theme song so I could listen to it at all times of my life because that's the type of life that I live. Tim, there was probably Super a year. Mario World. It's a blast from the past. <laughs> there was probably Fucking a year. Banger, dude. Banger. And I, I think this speaks to who we were as children, right? There was, a, there was like a year long period where every Saturday morning, I would wake up fresh at 7 a.m. to catch WB Kids and their oh, block yeah. of kids shows because it was always the new episodes of like Jackie Chan Adventures and Yu-Gi-Oh! and shit that like I needed to know. And I was awake before my sisters, before my parents. I was the only person awake in my household at 7 a.m. On a, on a fucking Saturday, like every fucking Saturday making it happen. Um, I miss it. At the mm -hmm. same time, I also like sleeping in it, so maybe I don't miss it. This week's host for Kind of Funny Games Daily go like this. On Tuesday, you're getting Greg and Gary. Wednesday, you're getting me and Janet. Thursday, you're getting Tim and Tim. Then on Friday, you're getting me and Andy. If you're watching this live on Twitch right now after this, is Greg and Mike playing some of that WWE 2K22. If you want to catch that stream later, you can, of course, subscribe to youtube.com slash kindoffunnyplays. Remember, this has been Kind of Funny Games Daily. Each and every day live right here on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames. We run you through the nerdy news you need to know about. We have a Patreon post show for those that are subbed at the silver level of patreon.com slash kindoffunnygames. So stick around for that. Otherwise, until next time, game daily.